السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We always commence by sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every single one of us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I'm sure you've heard people who are not Muslim say that Islam is very difficult. It has a lot of rules and regulations. Sometimes there are people who are interested in entering Islam, but in their hearts and minds, they feel that there are too many restrictions when I become a Muslim, perhaps life will become difficult. I need to pray at certain times, I need to dress in a specific way, I need to watch out what I eat, I need to make sure that my thinking is okay, I need to make sure that my clothing is okay, I'm not allowed to, to be with certain people and I can be with, so, with certain people and so on. And there are so many people who have so many rights that need to be fulfilled. And a lot of this sometimes gives the impression to those who don't know that Islam brings about distress in the life of a person. Well, according to the narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, made mention of in several of the books of Reasons of Revelation, he says that at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some of the people of Quraysh, they said the same thing and they thought the same thing and they used to spread the same thing. So they used to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam engage in long worship. And they used to see the Muslimin engaging in acts of worship. And they used to say, this Quran has been revealed in order for it to be a means of distress for those who follow it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive that type of thinking. Sometimes even the weak from amongst us who are not aware of the contentment that we achieve by following these rules and regulations, they feel too many rules, too many regulations. Everything is restricted. The truth is, what are you searching for? If you are searching for contentment, the minute you let loose, you lose all contentment. The minute you put restrictions on yourself, you will achieve contentment and happiness. If you run behind the world, the world is such that you will never ever catch up with it. It always moves quicker than you move. Let me give you a simple example. How many of you have the latest mobile phone? Perhaps the bulk would put up your hands. We have the, S, the S7. That's the one I have, mashallah. <laughs> You're laughing because it's not yet out. To be honest with you, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you have the latest one, it's only latest for a few minutes. After that, there is another one. It keeps you running and it keeps you running so fast. You have the latest motor vehicle. Five minutes later, there's another one. It distresses you. When you have bought the latest Mercedes Benz, for example, and you are so excited driving it to puncture your balloon in a split second. A man with the later one needs to drive past. It's over. Your millions are actually a means of your distress. And you think to yourself, what did I do? The same happens to your phone. The same happens to everything else. So Allah teaches you, you really want contentment? Be happy with what you have. Put on your blinkers. Thank Allah. Be restricted, restrict yourself, put lots of rules and regulations, and you will find yourself in, at, upon the height of happiness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us happiness and contentment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the opening verses of Surah Taha, making it clear that the Quran has not been revealed in order for it to be a means of your distress. Taha ma anzalna alayka al Quran li Allah says, Taha, this Quran has not been revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you become distressed. No, it is only a reminder for those who fear or who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah help us to... In fact, read the Qur'an and let it be the reminder for us to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a beautiful verse. In fact, it is reported that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, these verses were revealed in the early stages of Mecca. And uh, when he was, when he were, had an intention to go and harm Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stopped by his sister. And in the procedure, in the process, it's a long story, but he stumbled across verses of the Quran. These were the verses. And he says there was a question in his mind 
from a long time back that these restrictions, how do people find Islam appealing when it brings about so much in terms of restriction? So he says, when I came across these verses, as I read this verse, I knew this was a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to me, telling me that you know what? The Quran is not revealed in order for you to be distressed. Rather, by following all these rules and regulations, you will be free of all forms of distress. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah grant us happiness and contentment. Ameen. Then according to Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi and Ibn al-Mundir, they make mention of how the kuffar of Quraysh had asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looking at the mountains of Mecca, that you claim that the world is going to come to an end, everything will be destroyed, there's going to be a day of judgment. What is your Lord going to do with these mountains? That's a question. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies. He makes mention of the question and he gives them the answer. Verse number 105 of Surah Taha. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْجِبَالِ They are asking you about the mountains and what's going to happen to them. فَقُلْ يَنْسِفُهَا رَبِّي نَسْفَا فَيَذَرُهَا قَاعًا صَفْصَفَا Indeed, your Lord will blow them away with a single blast and He will leave the land flat without mountains. That's Allah. Take a look at the earthquakes Take a look at the volcanoes. Take a look at the movement of the tectonic plates across the globe and how it brings about so much change in terms of the land and the geography of that particular land. At that time, the kuffar of Quraysh knew no better. Obviously now with technology, the minute there is a tsunami, we would know across the oceans what has happened. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from these type of disasters and may He protect us from being punished. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us this beautiful 21st eve of this month of Ramadan. Allahumma inna ka afuun to hibbul afwa fa'fu anna. Oh Allah, you are most forgiving. You love to forgive. So forgive us and wipe our sins out. Ameen. Then we have Surah Al Anbiya, the next surah. And that surah is named after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you take a careful look at this surah, it shows us how the prophets are the chosen ones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has chosen them above everyone else. Allah yastafi min al malaikati rusulan wa min al nas. It is Allah who has chosen the messengers from among the angels and from among people. It's Allah who has given status to others higher than some. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. However, it does not mean that Allah is upset with you when you are going through turbulent times, when you are going through difficulty, when you are going through a period that may seem negative. It does not mean Allah is upset with you. Perhaps it is through that very problem or issue or difficulty that you will achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us are guilty of not calling out to Allah with such sincerity and then when we have problems and difficulties, we become the most sincere people. We start to cry. We get up for salah. We make the promises. We quit our sin. Wouldn't you agree that difficulty was the best gift for us? We got close to Allah in no time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those who wait for problems before we turn to Him. Rather, let's turn to Him during days of ease so that He turns to us or so that He assists us during our difficult days. I mean, so Allah makes mention subhanahu wa ta'ala of the call of all of these messengers, one after the other. Each one of them called out to him. So you will notice the words, Nada. Nada means to call out. He called. Who called? Wanuhan idh nada min qablu. And remember when Noah called out to us in the past. He was a messenger. What did he have to call out for? Allah says, no, he called out as well. And do you know what? Fastajabna lah. And we responded to the call. Amazing. Then Allah says, Wa ayyuba idh nada. And remember when Ayyub, Job, may peace be upon him, called out to us. And what does Allah say? Fastajabna lah. We responded to his call. After some time, we gave him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa zakariya idh nada. And remember when Zakariya called out to us. These are the cream of the crop. But they too called out to us, Oh man, are you going to be arrogant not to call out to Allah? Are you going to be impatient not to wait for the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Those better than you called out, they cried. 
They wept, they waited, and Allah says, we replied, we responded, we know, we heard, we were there, we know what went on. Subhanallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Yunus alayhi salam, Jonah, may peace be upon him. Allah speaks of the condition in which the Prophet Yunus, may peace be upon him, left his people and he was upset and so on. And Allah says, then he called out to us. You know, he was in the belly of the whale. And Allah says, we heard him. And Allah says, We responded to his call. Subhanallah. And after making mention of all of this, do you know what Allah says regarding all these prophets? <laughs> they used to strive to do good. They made an effort to do good. And they used to call out to us with hope and fear, hoping in the mercy of Allah, fearing the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had hope, they called out. The lesson I want to draw, and this is from the entire surah, it's not connected to a reason of revelation, but it's connected to the name of the surah. And the stories in that beautiful surah, Allah says, Al-Anbiya. This is, these are the prophets. And here's the lesson. So let's call out to Allah. Never become distressed and despondent, because you are going through a difficult time. Every one of us will go through difficult times. And the prophets, may peace be upon them, they all, without exception, went through difficult times. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it is the prophets of Allah and those whom he loves the most who are tested the most. And thereafter, those who are closest to the prophets in terms of example and following, they will have the biggest of the tests. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And may he make us from those who call out to him and never ever lose patience. I mean. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of something interesting regarding heaven and hell. We all know Jahannam and Jannah, they exist right now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned people of hellfire. So there's a verse that was revealed. You and whatever you used to worship besides Allah will all be the fuel of hellfire. So according to a narration mentioned by Al-Hakim of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, he says there was a man known as Abdullah ibn Zaba'ra. He was one of the cronies of Quraysh. He thought up something. He came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and he says, did I just hear you say that whatever we worship, us and everything that is worshipped besides Allah will be thrown into hellfire? Is it only for us or for everything that is worshipped besides Allah? So Muhammad sallallahu says it's not only for you Quraysh, but it's everything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asks a smart question. What's the question? You know some people worship Jesus, may peace be upon him. Some people worship the angels, may peace be upon the angels. What about them? Are they going to go into hell as well? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded with verse number 101 of the same surah, Surah Al-Anbiya. And Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ سَبَقَتْ لَهُمْ مِنَّ الْحُسْنَى أُولَٰئِكَ عَنْهَا مُبَعَدُونَ Those whom the best is preceded from us, for them, they will be distanced from the hellfire. They will never ever come close. So you cannot blame one who does not want to be worshipped, who is being worshipped besides Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the saints who don't want to be worshipped, but they're worshipped. The prophets who don't want to be worshipped, but they're worshipped. The angels who don't want to be worshipped, but they're worshipped. They are innocent. It's those who have followed. It's those who have done that which was wrong, who are responsible for their own actions. So this was a beautiful response also in Surah Al-Anbiya. And that was according to some of the narrations, one of the reasons of revelation of that beautiful verse. We then have Surah Al-Hajj. It is a surah that is named after the pilgrimage. And you and I know that this pilgrimage is compulsory upon those who are able and capable and certain conditions are met once in a lifetime. So how did it all start? It started off with Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Abraham may peace be upon him. And it continued to the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
had instructed Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam at the time to do certain things that perhaps did not make sense to him, but the fact that he knew it came from Allah, he knew it would bring about his salvation and happiness. People sometimes ask, when I break wind and I make wudu, I wash myself. I never wash where the wind was broken from, but I wash the rest of my body and I'm considered pure and clean. What's the sense behind it? The truth is, whether it makes sense to you or not, it's the instruction of Allah. Ibrahim alayhi salam did things that were far more serious that he didn't understand at all. But he knew it comes from Allah. It cannot be wrong. It's right. It will bring about some form of peace, comfort. Look at this. Centuries down the line, we say the name of Ibrahim alayhi salam in every salah, every time. Subhanallah. That's Allah elevating the status of those whom He loves because they followed His instructions. So if you want Allah to elevate your status and myself as well, all we need to do is obey the instruction of Allah. Make sense to you or not. You may want to research, you may want to search, you may find reasons, but you may not. So this was just one simple small example, but it's something really interesting. If we take a look at that surah, and I will move in order, there is a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari reported by Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. He says, there were people who used to come to Medina Munawwara and enter the fold of Islam. And then if their wives gave birth and their uh, horses uh, gave birth as well, so they saw offspring in terms of their own and they saw multiplication in terms of their horses, they would say, this is a good religion. And the minute their wives didn't give birth or something went wrong and perhaps if they saw for example that our horses are not multiplying they would say it's a bad religion now my brothers and sisters we need to know one very important point shaitan comes to us and makes us weak he makes us despondent when things happen your way you say oh mashallah beautiful faith Allah is merciful. When things don't happen your way, you start thinking, look at Allah, He's punishing me. It happens. Some people are weak. We need to realize and understand. Allah tests everyone. I remember there was a brother I went to meet in the hospital. And he was suffering final stages of cancer. And he told me, look, I, I'm thinking, and this is, this is a true story. And it goes to show how sometimes in desperation, people lose faith. Some people become stronger and others lose it. So the, the man tells me, he says, look, I'm thinking perhaps I'm being tested because I'm following the wrong religion. Maybe I'm a Muslim, so that's why I'm being tested with the last stages of cancer. A pastor came, up, came by meeting me earlier today, guaranteeing me that if I were to accept Jesus as my savior, I would be cured of cancer. And I smiled and I looked at him and I thanked Allah that I was sitting there. And I told him, brother, I have met 20 Christians in the same hospital who are suffering this disease. What about them? Subhanallah. It's got nothing to do with this. It's got to do with your faith. If that was the guarantee, subhanallah, what about those following that faith who have died of the same disease? So don't come to, to lose your faith upon the last moment. We believe that the one who made me is my personal savior. The whoever created me is the one who's my personal savior. I take him as my personal individual savior and he will save me the day I return to him and him alone. I don't need to take risks by saying this one and that one and the other one and son and daughter. No way. I say him and him alone. Who? Whoever made me. He's called Allah. The one and the one I owe my worship to. That's it. He is my maker. Amazing. And the brother began to cry tears because he realized that Allah was testing him. It happens to some people when they are sick and ill and we tell them seek medication and prayer. These are the two things that are permissible and they find themselves entering terrain that is superstitious, that exits them from the fold of Islam. That is only sometimes out of desperation. The devil comes to you and tells you, come, you'll be cured. All you need to do is perhaps cut up five frogs and take their legs and perhaps roast them and boil them and maybe pour a little bit of that water, perhaps on, on your head when you are showering and so on and thereby you lose your faith and your iman and conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon a moment when wallahi you have been softened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so let's not do that so Allah makes mention of this in verse number 11 of surah al-hajj وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حرف. there are some people who worship Allah on edge what is meant by on edge he explains it فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ when goodness comes in his direction, he's happy, he's calm. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ قَلَبَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ 
and when calamity or trial befalls him, he turns his face the other way and he loses his faith. Allah says, such a person has lost both this world as well as the next. And Allah says, that is a manifest loss. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So this was revealed on the occasion when the people used to come to Medina, enter the fold of Islam, when they bear children and they see multiplication in their horses, they are happy, and when they don't, they are sad. So Allah says, don't do that, don't do that. It's all from Allah. It's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Then we go to the verses of Hajj themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to announce the Hajj, to proclaim the Hajj. Announce it. Just announce that you have to come. So Allah says, verse number 27, And announce, proclaim the Hajj. They will come to you. They will come walking. Allah speaks about on foot. They will come on foot. Now there was a time, and this is mentioned in Tafsir al-Tabari by a Mufassir known as Mujahid, Rahimahullah. He says there was a time when they used to come but they only used to walk. They had this belief that you're not allowed to ride. Some people think that you're not allowed to ride. During the days of Hajj, you must walk. That's it. You cannot ride. They used to think that and they only used to walk. So when Allah revealed this verse, there was an addition to this verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَلَىٰ كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِن كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ Not only will they come walking, but even on every lean camel. They will come from every distant pass. Everywhere they will come. The proclamation was made to a small group of people. Guess who heard it? Every one of us. And we all want to go for Hajj. And we all make dua. Some of us go to the extent of lying in order to be able to be accredited for Hajj. May Allah forgive us. Really. Is that how low we stoop, my brothers and sisters? When others would like to go for the first time in their lives, and we are asked, have you been before? And we say, no. And you were there last year. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive the ummah. Really, we need to become people who are honest and upright, especially when it comes to matters pertaining to the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine, it brings me to the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something powerful we can all learn from. Did you know that Aisha radiallahu anha says, مَا خُيِّرَ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ إِلَّا اخْتَارَ أَيْسَرَهُمَا مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ مَأْثَمَا صلى الله عليه وسلم Muhammad, peace be upon him, whenever he had a choice of doing things two different ways, he always chose the easier way for as long as it was not sinful. So if there was walking and riding, he would ride. For example, if there were two ways of doing things, he did it the easier way for as long as it was not sinful. And this goes to show us that the body we have is actually entrusted to us by Allah. For you to be able to deliver comfort to that body of yours, if you can afford it and it is permissible, is actually an act of sunnah. It is actually an act of merit being taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this beautiful narration of Aisha radiallahu anha. Take a look at that. Some people think that if you're a Muslim, you need to struggle and suffer and make sure that, you know, you stand in the sun and burn yourself in order for you to be declared a faithful slave. No, you need to be a person, even if you're utilizing air condition, if you can afford it and it's there, mashallah, it's not being wasted and so on, and it is necessary. Alhamdulillah, there's nothing to say your salah is any less accepted from those who've endured the heat. But if you have endured the heat because you could have done nothing about it, perhaps you might have an added reward because of a condition that you were, or that was imposed upon you. But do you know what some of the scholars say? If you could have facilitated a little bit of that ease and you intentionally didn't, perhaps you have not fulfilled the right of the body that is entrusted to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, grant us ease. It brings me, you know, a smile to the face when I think the Prophet sallallahu conveyance made up of horse, camel at times, a donkey at some time, he always had the best, the best, subhanallah, of that which was available at the time. I wonder what would happen if we had to have the best lined up there outside. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. People would look at us and probably say as a religious person, you cannot afford to drive the S-Class. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He forgive us. Really, we've turned things upside down. We look at things as a matter of pride rather than a matter of ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humbleness and humility together with the sustenance that He gives us. Remember, pride is not connected to how much you have. It's connected to the attitude that comes with it. 
You need to know this. So if your attitude is still down to earth, you can own the millions and the billions. You're still the best person around. But even if you have a few coins in your pocket, but you have a bad attitude, trust me, you may be from amongst those who are more arrogant than the wealthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and grant us a deep understanding. So the people began to come for Hajj and mashallah, it was so beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them in every single way. I'd like to move on to Surah Al-Mu'minun. It is a beautiful surah also. And there is a very important incident made mention of by Ibn Abi Hatim, narration of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. In fact, just before that, there is a verse of Surah Al-Hajj reported in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi, Sunan Al-Nasai, Musnad Al-Imam Ahmad, narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He says, when the mu'mineen were driven out of Mecca, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu happened to say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We indeed belong to Allah and we are going to return to Him. If we are being driven out of our own homes in this way, where our, our wealth has been usurped, our land has been usurped and we're being driven out, what's going to happen? Perhaps we may be destroyed because we were instructed not to retaliate, not to fight back. People are taking your things. Yes, you walk out. We were gone. We went. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verse number 39 of Surah Al-Hajj. أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Indeed, permission to fight or to retaliate has been given to those who have been fought. Because they were oppressed. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu says, When I heard this, I knew that we will be permitted to make armies and go back in order to gain what was taken of ours. And this is why when we see a lot of wars in Islam, you find the Muslims were attacked initially. They were the ones who were oppressed. All they did was they went back in order to get whatever belonged to them. And they went back in order to ensure that those who had oppressed them had learned their lesson. There was nothing wrong with that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may He grant us goodness and ease. Speaking about Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, many occasions he used to say things and revelation used to come confirming what he said. That was the power of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. We believe that he was the second best to tread this earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who does not say radiallahu anhu after they hear the name of Umar has done a great disservice to Islam and the Muslims. This was a man whom the narration says when he walked down a gully, shaitan would dare to walk down the same. Rather, shaitan would walk down another gully altogether. This was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. What a great warrior. What a great man. What a great saint. It is reported that there was the verse number 14 of Surah Al-Mu'minun. When it was revealed, it describes the creation of man. Let's listen to how beautiful it is. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ طِينٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُطْفَةً فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ ثُمَّ خَلَقْنَا النُّطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضْغَةَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِظَامَ لَحْمًا ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَاهُ خَلْقًا آخَرَ What a beautiful verse. Where Allah speaks about how man is created initially from dust. Thereafter the semen, thereafter a clot, thereafter a lump, thereafter the lump converts into bone, and the bone is given flesh. And amazingly, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, at that juncture, before hearing the end of the verse, he said, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Glory be to Allah, praise be to Allah, the one who is the greatest of all those, the creators. He is the creator. Glory be to him. And as the Prophet ﷺ completed the verse, the exact words that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu had just uttered were then repeated by Muhammad ﷺ, and it is part of the end of the same verse. So when you hear, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Yes, it is revealed, but it was also confirmation of what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu has said. I chose to actually make mention of this in order to show you the status of this great man. There are people today who try and find fault in Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. This man, Abdullah ibn Abi Quhafa, what a great man. What a powerful man. The best to tread the earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is an insult to say his name without saying radiallahu anhu. And people are finding fault in him. People are cursing him. People are mentioning him with bad words. May Allah safeguard us. How dare we do that? The same applies to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan. These are the heroes of Islam. These are the, 
these are the cream of the crop, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a fraction of their dedication and their conviction and their sacrifice of Islam. Amen. Then we have a beautiful surah, inshallah, surah to Nur. It is a surah named after the light. And it is full of rules and regulations pertaining to accusations that are leveled against innocent people, rules of adultery and so on, and many other rulings, inshallah. Tomorrow, I will mention two beautiful, interesting stories that we learn great lessons from regarding those who were accused falsely and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to their rescue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May He open our doors. Allahumma inna ka afuun tu hibbul afwa fa'fu anna. Oh Allah, you are most forgiving. You love to forgive. So forgive us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.